On behalf of Zero Malta, I would like to welcome you to our last webinar of the year, a webinar on faith and human trafficking, testimonies of sisters working for the rehabilitation of victims, how the power of faith can help in the long struggle to rehabilitate victims. Since October 2020, we have organized 23 webinars on human trafficking in the light of the Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti encyclicals. In our webinars, we highlighted the importance of the work of religious congregations in advocacy and assistance to human trafficking victims and survivors at the local and international level. The 2nd of December is the International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. It is also the anniversary of the 2014 Joint Declaration of Religious Leaders Against Modern Slavery, signed in Rome by Pope Francis, Archbishop Justin Welby, Orthodox, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu spiritual leaders. Today, we have four special guests as speakers who have been and still are active in the field on behalf of human trafficking victims. First, Sister Olivia Umo, daughter of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul. She is the director of Safe Child Advocacy, a social service institution owned by the Catholic Archdiocese of Kumasi in Ghana, which provides multifaceted services to support, reintegrate, and promote accessibility for children in street situations. She has over 36 years of experience in the social work practice. Uh, and very grateful uh, for the participation of Sister Olivia. Second, Sister Patricia ebeck -Boulem, Sister of St. Louis, responsible for the Bakita House in Lagos, Nigeria, a shelter for returned victims of trafficking. Pope Benedict XVI honored Patricia ebeck -Boulem in 2012 with the highest papal honor for consecrated persons, the Pro Ecclesia and Pontifice Medal. So, welcome back, Sister Patricia. You have been a frequent uh, contributor to our webinars. Third, Sister Francesca Edet, daughter of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul. She is now permanent representative of Daughters of Charity NGO at the United Nations in Geneva. After the experience, of congressional leadership at provincial level in Nigeria from 2001 to 2010, she opted for a mission in the UK and worked with families in difficult circumstances and trained the young into volunteering for community development and leadership. She also engaged in spiritual accompaniment of religious men and women. She received the Papal Award Bene Menerenti Medal on the 19th of November 2022 in the Diocese of Port Harcourt in Nigeria in recognition of her mission to women in difficult circumstances. Thank you, Sister Francesca, for being with us. We are very happy that you are now in Geneva. Uh, and Sister Miriam Baike, oh, we know you for years now, and we are so happy to, uh, to have you back. Tonight, you will be the moderator you are the sister of Our Lady of Charity of the Good Shepherd, RGS. You are the main representative at the UN in Geneva for the RGS. You worked 30 years, 3-0, with survivors of trafficking in Germany and Albania. And you are board member of Renate and the Alliance of NGOs on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. And again, Sister Miriam, Many thanks for all you did for those webinars from the very beginning uh, till today. Sister Miriam, thank you for being with us. As moderator, you have the floor. Thank you. So uh, after this uh, introduction of all our speakers, uh, I have the honor directly to jump into the matter and give the floor to uh, Sister Olivia. Thank you for the invitation to share 
my testimonies on how the power of faith can help in the long struggle to rehabilitate victims. I will be very glad to share with this uh, webinar what we have been doing so far towards rehabilitation of victims of trafficking. Let me begin with a bit of introduction. I am Sister Olivia Omar. I'm a daughter of charity of St. Vincent de Paul. I'm a Nigerian national working in Ghana as a missionary for the last 12 years. I'm the director of self-child advocacy of the Catholic Archdiocese of Kumasi, a social service institution owned by the Diocese of Kumasi under the management of the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul since its inception in 2005. The outline of my presentation is very simple. I'll give a little introduction, which I have started, and then I will talk about actions that we are taking towards rehabilitation of victims, and then the power of faith, how the power of faith has accompanied us in this struggle, and then I will conclude. Let's talk about the target group and service areas that we cover. As I said, children in street situation are our major target. Children in street situation in Kumasi are migrant children who come from very poor, vulnerable backgrounds in the northern part of Ghana generally and also in other parts of Ghana. But the majority of them migrate from the far north of Ghana in search of livelihood in the cities. They are made to believe that there is a lot of money in the cities and they can make money to survive in the cities. Of course, there is some element of truth in that. So children from the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine, and above up to 25 young adults come into Kumasi, living on the streets with no protection, no shelter, exposed to all forms of abuses, violence, and sometimes fall victims to human trafficking. We work to support these children while on the streets, to also rehabilitate them, get them off the streets, and support them learn skills, give them access to formal education. In fact, currently, as I speak, we are supporting over 600 children in street situation in various development activities, including formal education and livelihood um, empowerment. We support and work with victims of domestic violence and children and young persons in abusive situations. Today, I want to talk about our interventions with victims and survivors of human trafficking and the way we support their rehabilitation. The photo there is showing children living on the streets, struggling for livelihood. Before speaking about our rehabilitation activities or interventions, with victims of human trafficking. Permit me to give a little, a brief context of human trafficking in Ghana. Ghana is a source, a transit, and a destination country for human trafficking, meaning that Ghanaian children or youths are trafficked to different parts of the world, including Saudi Arabia, Libya, Lebanon, Ivory Coast, Mali, and are taken through Ghana to other neighboring countries. Also, children, women, and youths from other neighboring African countries are also trafficked through Ghana. That makes it a transit. And sometimes into Ghana. 
and forced into prostitution within Ghana that makes it a destination. And these are the people that often we are there, we see, we meet, who escape and come to us and who we walk towards rescuing. As well as Ghanaians who are trafficked outside, when we get calls, we also work with other networks to rescue and to rehabilitate them. Within Ghana, we also have internal trafficking of children and minors, where children are taken from their poor families with fancy offers of access to formal education or skill training, but instead are subjected to forced labor, to abuses, to prostitution, and often they end up on the streets, engage in casual jobs on the streets, begging, hawking, and sometimes commercial sex work for survival. Some of these victims managed to escape from their traffickers within days, weeks, and months after they have been trafficked. Others suffer under their traffickers and only are left free after they paid their ransoms. Most survivors run to the police for help and others come to us directly through the help of other people, sometimes other networks, other organizations. We are also sometimes directly involved in rescue activities of victims with the police, of course. This photo you are seeing is one of our rescue um, exercise where we were notified of young people, hundreds of young people from French speaking countries who have been trafficked into Ghana and brainwashed and made to bring other people from their neighborhood, their friends and their siblings. Actions that we take to support these victims towards rehabilitation. We are largely involved in rescue of victims, as I've mentioned earlier. We provide psychosocial support to survivors. We provide shelter, safe shelter, where survivors can live for the period they are struggling with their trauma until they are ready to transit to return to their families or countries of origin. We support transportation of victims when they are ready to go back to their families. Reintegration is a major aspect of rehabilitation activities we carry out. We do this directly and we also work with other networks in other countries, such as the Talitakum Network in neighboring countries and with sisters of other congregations like the Sisters of St. Louis, like the Daughters of Charity in other countries like in Nigeria, because we do rescue a number of Nigerian girls. They, carry, they support us with the rehabilitation and reintegration of these children or young people in their home countries after they have been helped to return. We support victims' rehabilitation with livelihood and education empowerment. Some of the photos you will be seeing are the, the, the support, the livelihood supports of survivors. We follow up survivors in their communities, in their families, sometimes through networking with other organizations, institutions, and Catholic sisters. We provide family and community support by going into communities to educate communities against trafficking, 
educate families, help families to understand human trafficking and the schemings and to support their survivors. We also provide spiritual accompaniment for victims and survivors. This we do through prayers, praying with them, and also encouraging them in their faith journey. We work to reduce vulnerability of young people to human trafficking. And this we do by providing access to formal education and skill training for young persons in vulnerable situations to avoid them even being trafficked. The power of faith cannot be overemphasized in our struggle to the long journey of rehabilitation. Faith is our driving force in working to combat human trafficking, which is such an overwhelming phenomenon. Faith sustains us as we listen to the heartbreaking and scary stories of victims. Sometimes we do not have the needed resources to support the demands of victims or survivors, but our faith in the divine providence energizes us to open our arms and doors to welcome victims and survivors. We cannot overlook the power of faith of the victims and survivors themselves who, despite being broken, are ever resilient, hopeful, and determined to rise again and take position in society. It is the power of faith that helps us and the survivors to make the long journey towards rehabilitation. In the end, it is a struggle worth the trouble. As we can see in the testimonies of so many, like Ikaite, Ugoma, and all of the others that have survived this terrible evil. The power of faith has helped us greatly and our survivors in this struggle towards rehabilitation. To conclude, I would like to note the power of networking and collaboration which is really our deepest faith around combating human tra trafficking and rehabilitation of victims and survivors. We believe that together we can fight human trafficking. That is our deepest faith. Together, only together, we can combat this crime. Together, we can truly rehabilitate victims because when we stop, others can continue. And so, we are very passionate in networking and collaborating with like-minded organizations. We build and form the network of Catholic Sisters in Ghana and in other African countries against human trafficking through the Talitacom network. We network with various organizations and institutions within Ghana, including the government agencies, the anti-trafficking um, units of the Ghana police force, religious bodies, the Muslim community, the Catholic communities, the, the traditional institutions to combat human trafficking.
our deep faith in this struggle is that together we can fight human trafficking. Thank you so much for giving me this time and this opportunity to share our testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Olivia. Uh, you uh, told us or described uh, the pull factors for minors uh, coming to the big cities and are, uh, end up on the streets without shelter. And you described it's a big number. You spoke about 600. And you provide uh, not only livelihood, but you try to give them a future by education and everything they need. And of course, your work is more uh, wide, what you described, but we got a good um, overview also how faith, how strong the faith is a motivation to help and how faith uh, in a right way transmitted can be a big help that uh, victims of trafficking can heal. Now, after this uh, first, interesting uh, contribution. We are going to uh, Sister Patricia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants at this webinar, depending on where you are participating from. Our testimony this is the testimony of Bakita St. Louis Empowerment Network, given on this day, December 6, 2022, at the webinar on Religious Sisters Active on Behalf of Victims and Survivors of Human Trafficking. This testimony is given by Sister Patricia Ebebulem SSL. We are grateful to Ambassador Michelle and the organizers of this webinar for giving us the opportunity to share our testimony. Bakita St. Louis Empowerment Network is the project of the Sisters of St. Louis and has been in existence since 2014. We are involved in several anti-human trafficking activities at local and international levels. But for the purpose of this presentation, we will limit ourselves to our activities and experiences with victims and survivors of human trafficking. As sisters of St. Louis living in a shelter and working with victims and survivors of human trafficking, we have a lot to share and to thank God for this amazing and prophetic ministry. Our shelter is Bakita Villa, located in Ekpaja, Lagos, in Nigeria. In running this shelter, we'll live and interact directly with victims and survivors of human trafficking, whom we call treasures, because we want them to realize that despite their rough and traumatic experiences of life, God loves cherishes and treasures them as his children, created in his image and likeness, and so do we. So kindly permit me to use the word victims, survivors, and treasures interchangeably in this testimony. Our journey with the treasures begins from different points of encounter some at the airport when they are deported or returned voluntarily, some at our shelter when they are brought by organizations like IOM, Salvation Army, Soul Wadi, and so many others. No matter where or how we meet them, we welcome them to our shelter with a special party called No Place Like Home Party. This is to give them a sense of hope, acceptance, welcome, and belonging. Most of the time, they come back empty-handed, so we have to reassure them that all is not lost. Once there is life, there is hope. 
as soon as they arrive, they arrive at our Bakita home, rehabilitation starts. Our rehabilitation strategies and practices cut across counseling, pastoral care, which includes spiritual direction, and taking care of the needs of the victims. Most of these victims come to us battered and shattered. The traumatic nature of their experience requires great care, and this is what we give through counseling and spiritual direction. When they arrive at our shelter, as mentioned earlier, we begin by celebrating their lives. Nigerians love celebration. Those of them who are deported usually come empty-handed, and we try to reassure them that there is more to life than material possessions, and that once there is life, they can be what they want to be by the grace and blessings of God. We celebrate their birthdays and the birthdays of their children. We also work to allay their fears about the impact of juju in their lives. During this period, family tracing and reconciliation take place between the treasures, their families, and other areas from where they experienced deep hurt. It is also the time they acquire skills for life if they are not skilled already. During the period of rehabilitation, they are introduced to the program of Mindset Reset. This program is usually organized for them to reorientate their minds and bring them to the realities of life by training them on how they can reset their minds and focus more on values that keep them close to God and help them to live meaningful lives they are trained on how to choose and manage their businesses. Reintegration. This work of reintegration is carried out with each of them, each victim of human trafficking that is rehabilitated. During their stay in the shelter, they are prepared for quality life in the society. The goal is for them to be reintegrated into the society so that they live good quality life in dignity and live it to the full. John 10.10 10. To this end, those who already have skills are encouraged to perfect and update their skills. And those who have none are encouraged to learn and acquire skills according to their interest and ability. After skills acquisition, these survivors are empowered and equipped with materials to enable them run and operate their own businesses to support themselves and their families. This is one of the ways we tackle poverty which is a major ingredient in human trafficking in the developing countries. By establishing them in a trade, we reduce their vulnerability and the danger of being retrafficked. These survivors are also provided with fully paid and furnished residential accommodation and shops for two years, which is part of their reintegration package. After the two years, the beneficiary is expected to pay the rent from their proceeds. Reintegration assistance is very important because it provides the victims with what they can call their own. It prevents returnees or deportees from being retrafficked. All these notwithstanding, Sustainability remains a great concern. Reconciliation and reunification. This is an important aspect of reintegration, which ensures that the treasures are accepted back by their families. 
through family tracing and counseling. Very often, members of the family have to be counseled. Some of the treasures are welcomed with mixed feelings by their families, while some, unfortunately, are rejected. This is one of the challenging aspects of our work. Where there is threat from families or former traffickers, we employ the services of National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIB, since the treasures are registered with NAPTIB once they arrive our safe houses. Most of these victims are from poor homes and lack skills or formal education. This aspect of our program for them is to ensure that they go for further studies or learn vocational skills that can give them gainful employment or help them become self-reliant in the future. It also helps in family strengthening as also to support their families. Monitoring and evaluation. When treasures have been set up with any business, we go periodically to monitor them to see how their project is growing and assist them to overcome difficulties and challenges. We also follow them up through phone calls and video calls. Empowerment program. Most of these victims are from poor homes and lack skills or formal education. This year, we were able to empower two of the treasures with their mothers. We set them up in business. This also helps in family strengthening as they support their families. Moments of joy, new life, birth. This year alone, Bakita witnessed and welcomed new life in the babies brought to the world by five of our treasures. Three boys and two girls were born. This also highlighted the fact that sisters are mothers by nature. The sisters who live in the shelter with the treasures are caregivers, midwives, bedside nurses, and above all, mothers. When they had to be in the labor rooms to give moral support to the treasures who are young and inexperienced mothers, the climax was when one of the babies developed complications four hours after birth and was on oxygen for four days. And in the one week he spent in the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital last week, the sisters took turns in caring for the baby while his mother recuperated in another hospital graduation. Three of our treasures have finished their training and had their graduation on 18th November 2022. Reintegration. There's always a feeling of joy and gratitude when our treasures graduate and are equipped and reintegrated into the society. For this year, 2022, four of the treasures have been reintegrated. Four are in the process of reintegration, while three are still in training. Treasure on the staff list. One of our treasures is spending this year with us as a volunteer staff after her training. She's working in the shelter as an assistant matron and helps out in the bakery as well. Baptism. Five of our babies will be baptized on December 3, 2022. By the time this webinar is taking place, they would have been baptized. Another cause for celebration. 
end of year Christmas party. The survivors always look forward to this program every year. Christmas is a time to celebrate and share gifts. We celebrate with them to give them a sense of belonging and make them also have a feel of what the society is celebrating and to be in the mood for the festivity. Our Christmas party this year is on December 17 and it is a time for reunion for all of them. They see it as coming home as some of them spend the night in the shelter. The treasures who have left our shelter and have been reintegrated have a WhatsApp platform. They have planned for this year's Christmas party. We all look forward to it because we have a lot to thank God for this year, especially the safe delivery of our treasures and their graduation. You are all invited. Challenges. With all our joys and successes, our experience of this year would not be complete without mentioning our challenges. Some are to be expected, such as aggression and truancy because of the traumatic experiences of these treasures. Escape. Two of our treasures escaped from the shelter at different times. But to God be the glory, they were found and reunited with their families. Family reintegration and economic empowerment. This is becoming quite difficult as one of the treasures has been rejected by her family. This has not helped her to heal completely from her depressed state. It is also affecting her reintegration as she is being rejected by the landlords of those that could make accommodation and shop available for reintegration. She is still with us in the shelter and we are hoping that with time she will be healed completely. Mobility. This is a big problem because we do not have enough funds to purchase a bus, hopefully 18-seater bus, to facilitate the movement of treasures to the academy where they learn skills. This puts us and the treasures at a high level of security risk. Cost of living. As a result of insecurity and natural hazards like flood, which was severe this year and damaged the little farming done by farmers, the cost of living is now outrageously so high and so is quite challenging to meet the needs of the treasures. Conclusion Despite the challenges we remain eternally grateful to God and our key partners like the Sovereign Order of Malta, Slaves No More, IOM, Conrad Hilton, Mr. Gabi Moshud and ITB, Association of Lebanese Women in Nigeria, Small World and British Women Group, IHS, and so many others God has been using mightily to bring us relief and succor. Those mentioned and not mentioned, may God bless and reward you all abundantly. Thank you again, Ambassador Michelle, for giving us this opportunity to share our testimony with our treasures. Thank you all for listening and may God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sister Patricia. Um, as always, the most Im impressive for me is when I hear that you uh, name the uh, victims of trafficking that you accommodate uh, as treasures. You know? That is something that uh, is a, a deep spiritual approach 
to the worth of life of every human being. And uh, you spoke that you celebrate their lives and that you are working on a, a mindset reset, what is already uh, all very spiritual and has a lot to do um, with, the, with the faith. Uh, and then you, you go wider, you described uh, baptism and uh, everything you are doing for them to give them uh, hope and courage uh, regarding to our faith. Thank you very much for that. And um, now as the uh, next speaker, I invite uh, Sister Franca. Faith in the life of every believer is a lifelong adventure. In the scriptures, we see how faith led our father Abraham to respond to the call of God and to act with trust in God's providence. The same faith propelled Mary and Joseph to become foster parents of Jesus, the only Son of God. Our faith as Christian believers has in most cases been consolidated through the use of narratives and such narratives are well expressed and explored in the women and men of the scriptures. Very often I find myself going back to these stories to find inspiration as I engage in my ministry with our brothers and sisters who live in poverty or in other difficult circumstances. Shortly before the COVID-19 lockdown, I made a visit to the Safe Child Project in Kumasi, where girls who live on the streets have been rescued and helped to live a more normal life. As you see on the slides, these girls walked on the street as porter girls carrying heavy loads each day and being paid very little for all that they do. I like to use the narrative of the woman at the well to make a conversation with the girls to help them to explore their street life experiences and to be able to narrate both for themselves and for each other the difficulties they went through while living on the streets. And to do that, we used the narrative from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 4, which talks about the experience of the woman at the well with Jesus. And one thing that came out of this story was the fact that this woman was not afraid to share her own story. After having heard all that Jesus told her, she was not ashamed, rather she went further to spread the good news and to bring more people to listen to the stories and the words of God. And so with the women, the girls in the Marilac Center sharing their story was a form of advocating both for themselves and for others who may fall victim to trafficking at some other times. 
The issue of faith involves listening and growing and in the process of sharing the story deep faith was implanted and nurtured and helped to grow to help the girls become more competent in their faith life we needed to set up a network to help them to be able to communicate with each other and find support from their networks and through the process to be able to heal themselves of the pains and sufferings they have encountered in life. The Holy Spirit is part of this work of transferring and sharing faith because the Spirit continues to inspire us, to advocate for us, and to help us to become advocates for others. In the case of the girls in the Safe Child Advocacy, it was through this power of sharing they were able to help themselves, heal themselves, and to listen to each other. These are the girls that I'm talking about. And I watched them grow from first being afraid to talk about their life experience to developing trust and being able to share with each other. Today, we find them to be very happy and self-confident girls, not just because of the academic things they are learning or the skills they are learning, but also because they have had time to listen, to share their own brokenness and know that through this kind of sharing, they can receive healing, they can receive God's strength, and they can receive the support they need to survive in life. Welcome for this uh, testimony of, of faith. And uh, I liked, uh, especially when you placed the, the life um, or connected life and faith, like the narrative of the women at the well, this uh, story this in the gospel is about listening and growing. And you put it as faith and related it also to the listening and growing process that you, how you try to, to work with victims of trafficking so that people can, uh, can grow because they are listened to at, as Jesus at the well. That is like a very nice meditation coming out of this connection uh, from the gospel to the life of our, of our own life, of our today's life. Um, it, it, it is a bit, little bit unusual maybe that um, a moderator gives the word to herself, but uh, this time, uh, I'm, it's the first time that I'm going to speak at a webinar and I'm very uh, happy that this uh, have, um, that I can do this now. And uh, when we prepared this, uh, oh, Michelle has told me about uh, this webinar, and said, what, what, what can I contribute? And uh, we were speaking about faith, and, um, and we came up with the uh, topic of voodoo. Because we, uh, now I'm in Italy. I'm living in Italy since uh, nine months. And here, in, uh, many... Uh, Women from Nigeria are trafficked to Italy, and most of them have been or are under this curse of voodoo. So I want a little bit to explain what it is, how it works, and also I have spoken to several sisters of us from Senegal and uh, from Benin, 
uh, and also the sister who's working with uh, uh, victims from uh, of trafficking from Nigeria in uh, in Germany. Uh, how how can faith influence or how can this help? So that is what I want to explain. And um, so firstly, I'm a sister of Our Lady of Charity of the Good Shepherd. We were founded in 1641 by the French priest Jean Eudes. We have not only the three vows of, of obedience, poverty and chastity, but also a fourth one named zeal. The first vow was given to us by Jean Eudes with a meaning that we will work with all our energy to help women who are in prostitution to be able to exit prostitution. 1641, this vow was spelled zeal, zeal for the salvation of souls, because at this time the women were believed to be sinners. In the meantime, this understanding has changed. Women in prostitution are in generally not sinners, but victims of traffickers, victims of poverty, and are not doing this out of their free will. Until today, our congregation puts these women and all women and children in distress and at the margins of society in the focus of our ministries. I'm living in Italy since April uh, 2022, and uh, today I want to explain what women from Nigeria experience when they are trafficked into to prostitution to Italy. Nearly all of them have undergone a ritual of voodoo, and I will explain something about this too. Almost all Nigerian women who are in prostitution in Italy have taken the voodoo oars. The right of oars also includes an oars not to speak about the manner or content of the voodoo oars. Otherwise, there is a threat of illness, madness or badness. The word voodoo is a Haitian Creole rendering of several different West African words in several West African languages. The word Vaudin in its basic sense simply means spirit. So the term Voodoo can be understood to mean something like spiritism. There is no official church of Voodoo, no universally accepted sacred text and no standardized set of rituals. Voodoo takes on many different forms throughout the parts of the world in which it is practiced. The roots of Voodoo can be found in the various indigenous religions of what is today Nigeria, Benin and, and Togo in West Africa. In fact, it is not, uh, we, we have this connotation of negativity, of magic, but it is a belief that the, um, every, a spirit is in every living um, creature. Like I'm a human being, I have flesh, I have a spirit, and a tree has a spirit. No? And so this can be positive and for healing. But there is this negative side, but finally keeps the women in a prostitution, which is so much abused and uh, causes so much uh, suffering. There are also many similarities between Roman Catholicism and Voodoo. Both venerate a supreme being, name it God or spirit, and believe in the existence of invisible evil spirits or demons in afterlife. Each religion also focuses ceremonies around a center point. It's an altar in Catholicism and a pole or tree in Voodoo. So th there is something to relate to. And uh, now uh, Africa is a country, there is a lot of, so 15% of the people Uh, follow a traditional religion and the rest is uh, uh, with Christianity or Islam. But it, the, the belief in these spirits is still alive. So you can be a Catholic and still believe in the, in the spirits or a uh, uh, Muslim and still believe. So this is, this is, um, uh, it is a sort of culture and uh, I, I wouldn't say bad or, or do it differently, but when it comes to, to force people and to cause Uh, curses and, and fear and all of this, then I think we all can agree that this is uh, nothing good and that is, uh, that is something that should um, be conquered. And I, I also don't think that this negativity is a, is a um, 
but a sign of, of culture in Africa. No, that we cannot say this, but it is something that that has uh, gone in a in a very uh, negative way, and it's it's a sort of religion. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say all of this, but there is this, this branch, there is this practice that finally uh, causes uh, so much uh, suffering to the women uh, who are forced into prostitution. So uh, uh, also in, in, um, in uh, voodoo, uh, you have something like rituals of sacrifice and also consumption of flesh and blood. blood. You see, there, there are things related so that uh, it is a little bit, uh, when I started so, or, or saw it, it is, of course, it is, for me, it is very painful to see this, no? Because it is uh, used for something negative and for us in our face, it's positive. But now how to relate it and how to, to work with it so that uh, people can be uh, freed from fear. That is, uh, that is a question. So in the case of women trafficked from Nigeria to Italy, in most cases, this voodoo rite is celebrated in Nigeria in a shrine in the presence of a person uh, where you give a promise to. And the, the other, one person is receiving the promise and the other one is giving the promise. And um, families members of both sides are also involved. Now in case of this uh, trafficking, it is like it's a moment of this voodoo promise. The woman makes the promise. She gives the madam uh, organic material, material, hair, public hair, armpit hair, some cotton wool with blood and razor blade she used to draw the blood out. And she use, usually when she gives this, she prom promises to pay back 30,000 or 40,000 euros to this madam. And the money, the madam says, she spent to pay for the women's trip to Europe and to get a forged passport. And uh, normally at a voodoo ritual, the people hand over something and they take something. So when the woman hands over uh, her um, hair and uh, blood, um, then she also gets something and she, um, some are made to drink the blood of a freshly killed animal or eat the heart of a freshly killed animal. Like having this, this voodoo uh, magic, this voodoo uh, curse inside of themselves, and that makes it very strong because it, I have I have drunk it, no, I have it in me. And the madam then hands over the uh, material, the hair, the organic material from the woman to a voodoo priest. And at the same moment when the object of this course comes into the hands of the voodoo priest, he can activate the voodoo course that controls whether the demands and requests of the person to whom the promise or oars is pledged are fulfilled. The woman who makes a voodoo promise believes in it before, during and after the exploitation and even when uh, she has managed to escape. So this is really very, very strong. And the women believe that they have the voodoo magic inside them because during the ritual they drank or they ate maybe heart or blood. Now, when the woman has uh, successfully smuggled into Italy, they learn that their job to work for this money to be smuggled and what they have promised to pay back by work is prostitution. And they, they are, and they don't think they can escape. They have promises and the spirits are observing her and will do harm to her when she is not fulfilling and when she's not paying back. But however, at this, these days, they only receive 10 euro for when they serve one man and they have to pay for the rent. So it is practically impossible to pay back this money and the women are kept trapped in prostitution. Now, the exit from prostitution often happens in two phases. The first phase is internal. The uh, woman inwardly rebels against the power of the pimps, but is still a victim of their violence and abuse. And the second stage begins when she really can't take it anymore and is also psychologically ready to free herself for good. Then she starts to actively look for help and seek social services, police, individuals she can trust. And then when women are picked out or man manage to flee, the shelters report that they tell the families in Nigeria, no? And they, they are there when the woman can 
phone their uh, family and the families back home, they are constantly subjected to violence ex uh, and extortion. Most of the stories of the women who are taken into shelters end well when they get help, but not all stories end well. The women often suffer from post-traumatic stress. They first need help to overcome the fear they still have of the voodoo curse, even though they have escaped exploitation. The consequences of a voodoo ritual are very strong. It is always a source of terror for the women involved. The families in Nigeria usually do not know that the women have been forced into prostitution in Italy. They, they think she's sent to work and she has to pay back this money and then she can live in, in, uh, in Europe. When talking to their families, they make up stories, for example, that they are hairdressers. They have a responsibility to support their family back home who have often gone into debt to send them to Europe. There are women who feel safe when they come to a house of sisters. When they hear, when they see it, they, they feel a relief, they feel more safe. Or to a Christian house, because they feel protected. The voodoo religion, religion as I said, has Christian elements in its origins also, because uh, it was also it's connected with um, slaves um, who were Christianized, but didn't leave their... Uh, their uh, origin of uh, um, face, of the natural indigenous face. So women who belong to the voodoo religion usually have access to Christian faith. And it is not, so they, they, um, it, it's not something strange. No, it is something because there are similarities. And so uh, it is a positivity there in, in any case. But however, it is very difficult for a woman to leave this voodoo face completely as her family at home believes in it and puts her under pressure accordingly. The belief in ancestral spirits and souls is part of the culture in Nigeria and women have grown up with this belief. You can definitely give support to women through blessings and a positive attitude, so imparting through self-esteem and being a child of God. But that does not mean that the belief in this voodoo curse is not longer present in the belief system of a woman. It is a, it's very difficult and takes a long time to deal with it. Because she's, when, when she's in contact with her home culture, this is what is there. It is also part of identity, no? So, uh, I think what we can really do is, um, I have experience when, when I come with uh, blessed oil, and I, I mark the door or I mark the women. This is something which is positive, okay. uh, telling them to the Holy Spirit. No, this is voodoo. They have this connection to spirit. But we, we uh, Christians say there is a Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God fills the womb. And we have this blessed oil. So I can, I go and I bless a, a womb and I have the uh, blessed water. And so I say this blessing, the Spirit of God is there. So the uh, Evil spirit has no place anymore. And that is something they can relate to and they can uh, find peace. So I have often found, I often found that women who, who may, when I can pray with them and I can bless them and I use holy oil and holy water, they, they calm down and they believe in it. And then sometimes I give a little bottle of this Loretto water, blessed oil and, and, uh, blessed water. And it is a, it is a, a relief for them. So we have something, uh, but of course all these signs, no? you need the oil, you need something to touch. Uh, but I think if it's helping and it is, uh, it is positive, then uh, we, can, we can and should uh, do this to help uh, these women. That is uh, my take on uh, the work with uh, women who suffer voodoo magic. And uh, I don't uh, know if there are questions, comments in the, from the uh, auditorium. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think it was very good, very concrete. I must say, I don't see any questions, but possibly it would be good that uh, uh, Sister Franca and Sister Olivia could comment on. Well, Miriam, what you have said. It's, you know, actually a way that the madams and the mafia group 
Yeah. Use this procedure to keep the girls or the ladies connected with them. Because originally the people have this sense of fear of the power of the evil one. And they feel that if they break this rule, something terrible will happen to them. So they struggle. I mean, uh, it, it, commitments or vows, once you have broken it, there is a sense of fear there. So there is a struggle for our sisters who are working with women or children who are being trafficked, you know, to struggle with trying to get them out of this fear. It's a very big struggle. And to convince them that this power of the voodoo, it's only like a game that is being used to keep them captivated is an enormous task. But you have already said too that when they come into the sister's house, they feel some sense of trust, they feel some sense of protection, they feel some sense of being supported. That is the way it is. You know, the people have strong belief in the use of symbols like the holy water like the holy oil, you know, to drive away the power of the evil ones. You don't have to be trafficked to use holy oil or to use holy water, because for them, that is a symbol that they see. And faith is being expressed in, in that way. So far, people are not taking, you know, the, the symbols of the church for granted. They believe strongly that these symbols are there. And so to use it to give them some sense of relief, to give them some assurance, you know, that God is there behind them and that the power of God is greater than the power of any evil that has been used to enslave them. That is what I can say about that. And the thing is that it's not just people who are being trafficked have this great fear of the evil one. So for Christianization and evangelization, it's a big struggle that we have to work with all the time in order to mainstream the faith and to put the ones you know who are being misdirected in some kind of way of enlightenment and it's not an easy task much uh, sister franca uh, patricia able to reach us sister patricia please you know from what i heard franca sharing and um during miriam's own presentation too if you had listened earlier in my own testimony, I said one of the things we do is to reassure the girls when they come because they are still under that juju, we call it voodoo, but here they call it juju, they are all the same, whether voodoo or juju or evil spirit, you know, that influence. And I think um, Franca has said a lot of what we do actually. We try to reassure them that the God in them is more powerful than any force anywhere. And we try to help them with the use of sacramentals. And as Franca said, I don't want to repeat a lot of what she has said. And um, even people that are not trafficked, unfortunately, you know, anything that happens, any misfortune that occurs in Africa or like in Nigeria, is attributed to voodoo, attributed to juju. Nothing happens naturally. If anybody dies, even if you say the person died of cancer, it must have been an enemy that did it. So we try to reassure them and give them sacramentals. You find that 
in our shelters, you see many of our treasures wearing the rosary, wearing scapula, you know, all those things by way of protection and all that. So as I said, I don't want to repeat, Franca said it all. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, Sister William, would you like to make a yeah. conclusion? And, and after that, uh, and, and say a few words. Uh, yes. Concluding, please. <laughs> so, uh, uh, thank, uh, first, also thank you for the contributions, Esther Franca and uh, Sister Patricia, because I think we as, as Westerners cannot understand as well as you understand and also with the positive and strength of faith. So I'm very grateful. No, I, I was talking to a sister from Senegal. Unfortunately, uh, they, they planned also a contribution with video, but it didn't come. They were also busy. So thank you very much for, for your contributions. And uh, I think uh, it, with, with uh, four, four sisters here uh, speaking about uh, their faith and their very concrete help, it it's, uh, shows that uh, the faith is spiritual. It is something that gives us force, but it also urges us to go concrete to help our brothers and sisters in need and to help to make their life better. It is a it's a work that never ends, unfortunately, because the, the suffering of the people never ends. And uh, I want to thank uh, all the sisters. It was like feeling being home with you and have this wonderful exchange about the the force uh, and the, the love that is urging us in the name of uh, Jesus Christ to go and help our brothers and sisters in need. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Miriam. Thank you for those wise words, reaffirming also uh, our faith in Jesus Christ. I think it's uh, <laughs> we we have to be proud of uh, of uh, our Savior and to be part of, of him, especially now uh, in this Advent uh, season. Uh, so thanks, Miriam. Thanks to all speakers and participants. Also, my special gratitude goes to Yves Reichenbach, our webmaster, and my assistant in Geneva, Clara Brega Ezepi, and Emanuele Piluso. The video recording of this webinar shall be available in a few days on our website at laudatosi.org with subtitles in English, French, German, Italian, Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. Feel free to share the link. And uh, our online course uh, on human trafficking for helpers uh, is available in English, but also is now translated in French uh, on the cuhd.org website. And it will soon be available also in Italian in German. And to end this last webinar of the year, I want to share with you a short video testimony by human trafficking survivors, treasures of Sister Patricia, living in the Bakita House shelter, Lagos, uh, shelter in Lagos, a uh, video uh, sent by Sister Patricia. I have a lot to thank God for in our Bakita Villa. God has been so wonderful and marvelous to us. The presence of our treasures have been a great gift. Their graduation, wonderful things. God has blessed us in various ways. And so, some of our treasures will now share their testimonies of giving gratitude to God. I thank, I thank God for the gift of life. I thank God for everything he has done. He has been always there, doing great things in my life and in the life of many people. God has been on our side since we started the journey, many of us, but many are no more alive. Many have lost their life and many are still there. But we thank God for life. I returned to Nigeria. It has been wonderful things that has been happening to me. I've learned a lot coming to the shelter of Bakita, Sisters of St. Louis. It has been wonderful for us. Many people have been supporting us. 
we give God the glory for helping us to learn trade. Like I learned computer. Presently, I'm still going to school. I thank God for that. And many of us are still learning work. It's a great thing. My little advice for many people out there, if you wish to come back, you can come back. God will always be with you. He will support you. He will send your guiding angels. They will help you and life will be free with you. If you come back, you have free access to talk to your family. Many people will be there to pray for you. You will feel okay. You will feel happy. Being in the Bakita family, I meet many sisters, many different girls that will interact together. will feel so happy as a good family. Please, I'm advising those out there. If you go to any country on your own or someone has taken you there, don't be afraid. You can come back and make it in Nigeria. You come back home and you make it very good. It's only determination. Once you put your mind there, you will be free and you talk to your family anytime. The greatest thing is I talk to my family anytime, any hour I want now. And I've achieved a lot. So I thank God for that. And I pray that God will help all of us out there praying for help for anyone to come and rescue us so that they will come and help us, will come back and give glory to God. I thank God for my life today. I also thank God for the life of my children and deliver us safely without any oppression. And I also thank the sisters for the love they give to me and my children, the food, the clothes, and this, any other things. I also thank God for this. When I came back to Nigeria without any accident or without any sickness, I came back safely without any accident on my way coming back. I also thank God for the IOM that brought me back. So my advice people out there, I want God to touch their hearts for them to remember home. Because many of us do not go without telling our parents, but I wanted to come back safely without any accident, without any sickness. Because many of us died on our way coming back, and some of them had sickness. But me today, I came back without any accident and sickness. My happiness today is for me to deliver safely without any oppression. And I have my children with me. That is happiness. That is the great thing in my life I have. Have my children beside me. And sisters help me a lot. Without them, I don't know what to do. Because I don't have any money to do anything to take care of them. But they help me a lot. I appreciate the love of the sisters and the IOM. Thank you. First of all, I thank God for the gift of life. I thank God for all He has been doing in my life. Even the life of my baby. I thank God. I appreciate God for his loving kindness upon my life, upon my life of my baby. I also thank God for making me return from where I travel out to Nigeria safely. Since I returned to Nigeria here, to the family of St. Louis sister, they have been my family taking care of me even before I came back, I cannot even try to reach my parents, nobody, people taking care of me in Lagos here. They have been so caring and lovely to me and my baby. So I also thank God for through them. Now I can be able to talk to my family, can be able to share my experience to one another, can be able to talk to my family, reach my family, my brothers and my sister over there. So I pray this moment that God Almighty should help every and each and all of us who travel out that does not want to return back to Nigeria. That they should not lose hope. That they should hope that one day they will come back to Nigeria and testify the goodness of God in their life. So I also thank God once again since when I came back, I've been through training. I learned how to sew. I also learned how to bake. Through the Reverend Sister, St. Louis, they have helped me through a lot. They sent me to school. 
I've learned how to sew, I learned how to bake, I learned how to make a lot of things, even soap. So I thank God so much for using them to help my life and help the life of my baby. My baby has been going to school throughout the day I came to Lagos in the family of St. Louis sister. They have been the one taking care of me and my baby. They even sent my baby to school. Now my baby is happy. She is there. She can talk and she can sing other songs which they are teaching them in school. So I appreciate what they have done in my life. So I continue to thank God. And I pray for all of our girls who travel outside the country. That God Almighty should help them to return back to their country and to pass through the Reverend Sister to help them so that they will be able to give a testimony of joy in their life. All this I ask that the God Almighty should continue to guide them and bring them separate Nigeria. All this I ask through Christ our Lord.